My name is Lindsey Grimm. I'm the Emerson RD. <laughs> Thank you. And I also have the privilege of serving on this year's Focus Week committee. And as you know, we are in the midst of a Pillars of Perseverance Week. And just want to give a couple of reminders. Um, first of all, that Capox Day signups end at 1 o'clock today. So if you have been continuing to think about that opportunity, I want to encourage you to take advantage of it and to sign up by 1 o'clock today. I also just want to remind you that we continue to have events going on all week, and so take a look at the schedule that was handed out in Monday's chapel or online for the continued events. You are in for a real treat today. In a little bit, you will be hearing from our chamber singers, and then we have three faculty and staff who will be coming up and sharing little vignettes of their journey through some hardship that they have faced, and they will be responding to what practices of perseverance have helped them through this difficult time. And they will be introducing themselves as they come up, um, but first we will continue our worship by hearing from the chamber singers. It hurt right here. It hurt for a long time, and it didn't feel good. And I wasn't always sure why, but it just hurt right here under my ribs. And I didn't like it, and it wouldn't go away. So I lived with it. And I just tried to stay faithful with God, tried to keep moving forward in life. And I was in Ridgeway, Colorado, on a retreat during a sabbatical, alone at a friend's cabin with the opportunity to finally be still, take walks, not talk to anyone, and examine what was going on. So this is our family, and you might know, some of y'all know that cute blonde-haired boy. <laughs> He's about eight years old there, but you wouldn't know Alyssa. And Alyssa was uh, 14 years old on August 17, 2005, when Travis came running in our bedroom saying something's wrong. By the time I got to her, she was just breathing, she was passed out, and we went through all the process of 911 and getting her to the hospital. And then we spent a couple of weeks trying to figure out what was on, and we ended up down at Children's Hospital. And they tried all kinds of things, but didn't know what was wrong with her. But she did come out of uh, the coma she was in, and she stood, did start breathing again on her own, and we were hopeful. And then they did a biopsy, and we went over to the doctor's office, and the surgeon was an older surgeon and a very good one, and he gave us a name this long and said, it's a brain tumor, which is pretty stunning. And Allison said, is she going to die? Yes. When? Within two years. And we left. And then everything fell into place that God had prepared for the moment he knew we were going to need it. Because I believe we had a community already set and God had prepared us a boat, an ark if you want, that when the flood came, we wouldn't be swept away. And that when we needed something, friends came and fixed the leaks and they resupplied the boat and we started living life as best we could knowing that our daughter was going to die. It's some process that we were learning day by day. But then we met Alyssa's oncologist, Dr. Zach Rulis, and he said, there's only a 10% chance, maybe 15% that she can survive this. And if she does, the radiation will cause more cancer within 15 years. A lot of decisions to make. And he said, but you must maintain your hope. You must maintain your hope. So we did, we decided hope was the way we were gonna go. What do we need to do to get through this? And so friends came alongside. In the hospital, Brad Elliott was suddenly right there by my side in the emergency room. Somebody called and he just came. And our pastor was there. And then down at Children's Hospital, Allison and I were trading off spending the night in Alyssa's room and I get up about six because the doctors come around at 6.15, so I got up to go out and shave. And I walked out, and here's John Goldhammer, my friend from Claremont, just standing there, 6.15 in the morning. John, what are you doing here? I just came to give you a hug. And he did. 
sitting Shiva, just being there for a few minutes. Don't tell me anything, just being with me. Friends, friends did that over and over through this time, through the 10 months that we got to make memories and be in denial for a little while to just enjoy what we could and have good memories. And then Alyssa, there came a point where we had to tell, we have a family group of three families and eight kids, and we had to sit down with them and say, Alyssa, there's nothing else I can do. She's going to die. Didn't know when, but she was on that road of just going to die. And so Make-A-Wish came in, and she got her Make-A-Wish. Well, she wanted to make a wish, and uh, she said, I want my whole family group to go to Disneyland. And they said, well, we don't do that. We just do the immediate family. Okay, we'll get by with that. But then this business class had a little project, and they made Make-A-Wish their project, and they raised $25,000. And they said, what do you want? And Alyssa said, I want to take our whole family group. And look who went to Disneyland and stayed at the Grand Californian. Our family, and the Elliott family, and the Rank family, and Allison's two sisters, and three nieces. All expenses paid, and Alyssa got her wish because some people contributed above and beyond what we could have imagined. So on July 4th, 2006, as friends stayed around the clock for the last 24, 48 hours, just sitting with Alyssa for an hour or two at a time, where she couldn't talk anymore, she was barely, she was, it was hard. I stayed outside digging in the dirt, just trying to avoid what was coming. And she died on July 4th, 2006. And then on July 15th, I sat here at the front and we had a celebration service of her life. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And every year on July 3rd, we have an Alyssa walk and friends come and we just walk around the block and have an open house and just remember Alyssa and show her a slideshow and just remember her and how God graced us with a child who blessed us and blessed Travis uh, in so many ways that helped him become the person he is today. This is my wife, Allison, and me, and we celebrated our 34th wedding anniversary last Saturday. And she was a wonder, and she was amazing all through Alyssa's night. She just took charge, and she actually did everything. She was strength, and she just did everything she could. And actually, at one time, when Alyssa just was barely just gasping for breath, she said, I would take any more, I'd take one more day, I'd do anything to have her one more day. She was brave, and she was amazing. And 14 months after Alyssa died, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she chose to have a mastectomy, and we worked through that one and got through that, but it was hard to have her sit there in the doctor's office and the doctor say, you have breast cancer, and she says, am I going to die? Because that's what we knew about cancer. But she's alive, and she's doing well. And then there was a tea fire in 2008, and uh, Allison called me and said, did you know there's a fire? I said, no. So I came home at 10 to 6. I looked up, and there was fire coming down from the arches. So I got my family out because I needed to be here with the, with, the, uh, with the 500 students here as part of the evacuation team. And I got them off into the Elliots and was stopped behind the house and looked behind and said, I feel good. I worked hard on cleaning up brush. I worked with the whole neighborhood. We cleaned brush immensely all the way around. The house is safe. And so the next morning, this was very disappointing. The house was gone. I did everything I could and it was gone. And now, welcome to our living room. And if you look down there, right on the left lower corner, that's Allison's grand piano. And here's where God starts telling you, I'll take care of you. A friend immediately says, I'm gonna find you another piano. And the first thing we had with no house was a grand piano. He found one <laughs> and we had a grand piano and Chris Milner put it in her house and held it for us until we moved back in uh, 51 weeks after the fire and uh, that music is glorious every time Allison plays that piano. And on the back porch, if you look there, you can see Alyssa on that name. That was her last handprint that we imprinted, and it survived the fire. So rest, not a restoration, but God kept giving back, and he kept giving back all the way through. So we went through a lot of losses. A lot of things happened, but the community of our church that we've been in since 1980, our pastor that married us, and friends and our family group and the Westmont community came around us and helped us survive and get through. So now, this is our family, 
And that heart locket Allison's wearing keeps reminding me when she has those things that Alyssa still lives in her heart and she's with us. And loss is a part of life. I know everyone in here has had losses, some very severe and some just, I lost a race, I didn't get the grade I wanted, but we've suffered with it and we have to grieve over it. And grieving is essential and it's personal. And grief is gradually absorbed into our lives and becomes a part of us, but it never quite goes away. And so we have to reconstruct our life and there's an acute stage where grief is focused on emotions and it takes over, it just colors everything the emotions do. But then we get to the reconstruction stage and we turn the corner and we get to begin a new life, regain a passion for life, and our emotions are set free. And the movie call, and the show called The Midwife that Alice and I are enjoying, and I'm seeing where a person is lamenting the loss of a loved one, a woman says, keep living your life until you feel alive again. And that's the way I felt, and there's so much I could tell you of getting through that. But on February 11th in Ridgeway, Colorado, I found out the pain was gone because I believed that my friends persisted, that hope endures, and that God is faithful. Thank you. I often have felt like an anomaly amongst people. I have one of those stories that seems to touch on a variety of hardships. I'm adopted. My abusive father abandoned me when I was 10. I grew up in poverty, and I was a child of welfare. And I have sadly lost precious people in my life through cancer and sickness. Life has not always been easy, as I know that it's not been easy for some of you in this room. When I think about perseverance, I think about grace. I think about the fact that it is an honor to stand in front of each of you and say that I have attempted to run a good race and to defy all the odds that have been laid out against me. It's an honor to say, my God is good. My God has given me strength to face each day with a boldness and passion for life. And I share these things not in shame, but as a part of my story and as a reflection of how God has healed and restored me with the hope of providing hope for so many of you in this room today. But let's not get ahead. One of the most complicated questions anyone can ask, is, uh, ask me is about my family. I'm often asked, Shannon, how many siblings do you have? I often pause, try to deliberate what answer I should give. Should I give the easy answer or provide a more complex response? No matter what answer I give, I know it will provide confusion or curiosity. In fact, I often smirk when asked questions about my family because I know it's going to bring on more questions and expose my more complex family history. Here is my narrative in a nutshell. My biological mother fell in love with my biological father and they found themselves uh, pregnant with me. Surprise! As any good couple in the 80s would do, they married. And I hope that in that marriage, they believed that good things were in store for our family. But sadly, that was not the case. You see, my father was an alcoholic, an addict to drugs, and was very abusive. For the earlier part of my life, I was exposed to horrific fights, painful beatings, and was acutely aware that my home was not safe. But the truth of the matter is I loved my family. It was instinctual. In fact, I still have a love for my family. I think that it's why it's so hard to deal with brokenness. There's a strange grief when your family does not operate as a healthy whole, and there is a significant loss no matter what age you are, you feel it and it impacts you. The violence grew and at the age of six, my mother separated from my father with the help of my grandparents. My mom, however, collapsed under the stress of separating from my father, and eventually I was removed from her care at the age of seven. Her stepsister, Jacinta Hope Buchanan, who my family family refers to her lovingly as sis, uh, she was the person that intervened on my behalf. She became my advocate. She became my voice, and she demanded that my family situation change. 
Both my grandparents and her agreed to take care of me. And at the age of seven, I was permanently removed from my biological parents' care and would never live with them again. For seven more years, I went between homes. I would live with my grandparents and then I would live with sis. Sometimes we would all live together in one big giant house, um, but circumstances really determined where I would live. I changed homes almost every year. It was during this back and forth season of my life that my biological father also decided he wanted nothing to do with me. At the age of 10, he told me over the phone that he was leaving me due to my new family and blame me for our circumstances. The last thing I ever heard about him was that he passed away five years ago. I grew up without a father and he without a daughter. And that is a significant loss for me. Eventually at the age of 14, Sis legally adopted me. She decided I needed some kind of normal family, and so when she got married, both her and her husband decided to pay all my legal fees, buy a new home, and create a space for me to have consistency. Sis became my anchor in, my, in many ways, and she became a refuge from the chaos of my life. And it's for this reason, when I talk about Sis, I refer to her as my hero. At the age of 14, I had found some kind of normal. And when people ask me how many siblings I have, I often smirk and I respond, I have two half-brothers and a sister, one stepsister, and three adopted siblings. It's beautifully complicated. I share the details of my life not to overwhelm you. I know that it's heavy. The goal is not to leave you with that heaviness today, nor make you feel sorry for me and my sad little tale. In fact, I'm purposely sharing this narrative because I believe it reveals something unique about the gospel. It is my story to share and is one that I believe reflects a narrative of hope and perseverance. So how did I overcome these obstacles? How did I overcome the feelings of abandonment or the loss of a normal family? There are three practices that I believed helped me and still help me in the practice of perseverance. First, I allowed a mentor in college to speak in my life. I allowed her to hold up a mirror to my circumstances so that certain truths would be revealed. She was willing to ask me the hard questions and made space for me to admit my grief. You see, I'm good at denial. And to be honest, I was good at keeping relationships superficial so that I would not have to admit my feelings of loneliness, my fear of abandonment, and my deep-rooted insecurity. But my mentor was bold. And she was fearless, and she was patient, and she was kind, and she made space for me to grieve and taught me how to be brave in facing the truth of my life. It was powerful to say that I was hurting and upset. Being honest about my life was liberating, and I no longer had to sit with its burden. I could be free because I commit that it was difficult. Mentors are powerful people. And it's in her influence that has made me serve as a resident director for these nine plus years. It's why I desire to help liberate others in their own story so that they may persevere as well. Secondly, I practice gratitude. Seriously, I really do. Um, there's a lot of things that I can count on as a loss in my story. However, there are just as many blessings and acts of grace. I was raised by a multitude of people where so many people do not have a single advocate or a guardian. The cycle of abuse in my life was broken while others have to live with, live with it for their entire childhood. I was adopted while others have been moved from home to home through foster care. I have a close relationship with my grandparents. I did not go hungry. I had a home. My cycle of poverty is broken. I have a college degree, an MA in theological studies, and I'm happily married to a wonderfully sexy man named Denzel Barham. Can I get an amen? Had to sneak that one in. I have so much to be grateful for. It could have been so much worse, but it wasn't. And gratitude helps me see the silver lining in my story. Gratitude helps me not be defeated, but to see optimism in the face of my suffering. If it had not been for the broken family that I had, then I would have never been adopted, would have never had the means to go to college, would not have had a master's degree, and would not be working at Westmont College. 
If I had not had the broken family that I had, then I would have never been brought to church by my dear Mimi and met my Savior, Jesus Christ. Without my broken family, I would not be shaped into the person I am today and therefore might not have this life at this very moment. And so I pause and I look at it and I say, I am grateful. Third, I worship. I sing all the time. In my car, in my home, I often sing loudly in worship services, much to the chagrin to the person next to me. I sing, and I have so much to sing about. My faith has been the greatest pillar of perseverance for me. It is my anchor. Jesus is not only my savior, but my healer, who has crowned me and calls me his beloved. My faith has been the cornerstone of my strength. When I read the Bible, I am struck with messages of perseverance, and I am reminded to run the good race which has been laid out before me. I am told that I am adopted in Scripture, that I am chosen, loved, and that I have purpose. Jesus is my hope and my strength and the one who has shaped my character. And so I sing. There is something powerful in being able to vocalize what I feel inside, to sing the words that I echo in my heart, for it is well with my soul, for I have a healer, redeemer, father, and friend. In all honesty, what drives my worship, my song, is that I believe strongly that my life and your life is really a story that God is pinning. Our story is to be known, to be authored, and to be expressed. God has authored each of us with a peculiar story so that we might reflect the unique aspect of God. There is only one Shannon Barham, and the story that I profess is uniquely mine. It is my mark, it is my truth to be told, just as your life is unique to you and is meant to be told. Your story has value. God as creator is the author of our lives, and God pins our lives in such a way as to reveal God's divine glory. Our story, both in the good and the tragic events, is one that gives unique expression to our creator. Ephesians 2.10, for by grace that you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are God's workmanship. In the Greek, the word is poema, which means masterpiece. In English, we get the word poem from this word, and the term means something that is composed or constructed of work of art. We are the artistic expression of God. Paul is communicating to the Ephesians that we are not our own masterpiece. We are a masterpiece only because we are God's masterpiece, totally unrelated to any effort or merit of our own. God is the author of our lives, and we are his great poem. So that is why I sing. I was made to sing. My life was meant to sing. We are made to worship with our lives, for God is with us and is working through us in our stories in powerful ways. I persevere because I know that my story is a part of a larger story, and it's still unfolding And that is why I have hope. Amen. Osteomyelitis. It's a rare form of um, disease. It's basically an infection in your bone that spreads throughout the body. Um, Now, these days, it's considered to be curable and treatable, but way back in 1970s, mid-1970s, and where I was in South Korea, it was considered to be fatal and incurable. That's what I had, about three and a half years old. Um, And my case was very rare because uh, the infection recurred every 15 days. Usually the recovery from a uh, surgery would take about a month. So it doesn't really kind of, it's not in a good condition. Uh, We 
consulted doctors, I saw five different doctors, they all recommended or strongly actually said the amputation may be the only hope, uh, amputation of my left arm. But even with that, the chances of living will be probably five to 10% and you probably need to get ready. Well, they said that to my mom, <laughs> so I probably didn't understand what that really meant. Um, I couldn't wear anything with the sleeve on, um, so the size of my arm was the size of my thigh, and there are all kinds of stuff inside. Um, to make a long story short, however, I experienced a miraculous healing uh, from Christ. Um, so doctors actually, after two months actually, they could not find the infection. Uh, but the entire process of healing took about the subsequently four years. Fast forward um, to my uh, second year in high school. Uh, I, one day I collapsed in school. I was taken to the emergency room. Uh, I was in a critical condition for several days, uh, in and out of con you know, consciousness. Turns out that I had internal bleeding for a while, uh, which uh, no wonder I felt kind of dizzy and uh, kind of tired. <laughs> it's kind of difficult to kind of go upstairs and so on. Um, and it was very painful. Um, Doctors couldn't actually uh, find the ways to uh, stop bleeding uh, in my organs. Um, and uh, I experienced another healing, to make a long story short. Uh, but I was hospitalized for about 70 days, and subsequently that led me to uh, really kind of fre frequenting the hospital very often. Uh, eventually, that led to uh, the condition I think I have now, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, uh, that all the um, uh, symptoms that come with that, such as migraine, uh, insomnia, and um, widespread uh, pain, irritable uh, eyes and irritable bowels, and from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, I don't know what it is like to live without pain. It's only, wow, is it really possible to live without pain? <laughs> Every part of my body shouts in pain, throbbing pain, shooting pain, stabbing pain, burning pain, pounding pain. Um, which often wakes me up at night and I have a hard time falling asleep. Um, However, I do have a distant memory of being healthy at some point, living in pain. Um, the intervening years uh, after the osteomyelitis and before the internal bleeding, for the year about maybe uh, 10, 10 years or so, uh, probably that's the only time I remember living without pain. As a matter of fact, I was pretty athletic, if you can believe it. Uh, played all kinds of sports, uh, including basketball. Yeah, it is really true. Um, and, uh, you know, volleyball. And even, uh, kind of embarrassingly, I confess, being an Olympic hopeful for track and field at one point. Um, now, all those things only remain as a memory. Uh, it's uh, part of the loss that I had to actually deal with in the last sort of uh, 27 years of my life. So three quarters, I'm early 40s, and three quarters of my life I had to deal with some sort of physical ailment, challenge, or pain, both acute and chronic. Many times I was in critical condition, emergency room, urgent care, very familiar places. Um, many months and even years I was bedridden, completely bedridden, immobile. Now, looking at the bare walls of hospital, really thinking about, or if I had a, a 
if I had an energy to think about uh, the purpose of life and God's love. How did I get through that? I'm still actually going through that now, even at this moment. Some practices, uh, faith practices. Faith was my lifeline, as Shannon shared with herself. Faith was a way for me to fight for faith and hope and love, a way to fight against cynicism, hopelessness, and helplessness, and bitterness. So faith is a capacity for theological imagination or theological reimagination of reality in the face of seemingly unfixable reality of my own physical body or brokenness within the story of Jesus Christ. So I decide to worship to the extent that I can muster my energy and think. So typically, this actually comes from my own family practice. Um, Apostles' Creed, always start the uh, worship with Apostles' Creed and end it with the Lord's Prayer. That's my liturgy in between self-preaching. That was my self-talk. Self-preaching of God's truth. I needed to verbalize it, not just kind of think in my head and try to remember where that comes from in the Bible, but I need to verbalize it, hear it, myself. If I don't have energy to say that myself, I heard. So the messages and friends, um, the sermons, uh, reading the scripture again, if I had energy, and memorization, singing. I love to sing as Shannon does. Um, I don't enjoy writing, but I enjoy singing. So Singing praises, again, I needed to hear the words, the hymns, um, prayer. Prayer for me was expressing my raw God honesty and grief before God. At the same time, giving thanks to God, finding a way to be thankful, affirming that each day is God's gift, while realizing that the each day is another day of pain, but realize that God's gift typically comes in the midst of pain, not apart from the pain. Um, so prayer, uh, praying psalms. But my most uh, frequent prayer, maybe my most favorite prayer, was the old early church prayer. The Jesus prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy. Sometimes that's all I could pray, and many times my prayer was simply groaning, groaning in bed. Now, in terms of uh, health practice, I incorporated these faith practices into uh, the something I had to do, the exercises. I have a pretty regimented sort of exercise schedule. I have to walk. Um, there are many years that I was completely immobile, but these days I am mobile. I have to keep moving. So um, walking, prayer walk, basically. I was I'm grateful. I'm surrounded by my friends and family and uh, alums and students who would like to walk with me. Uh, so we, when we pray, depending on my prayer partner, either we pray for each other or pray for others with each other or simply do catching up. Uh, how our days are and what are we are thankful for. Um, stretching. Daily, it's something, it's painful. It is really painful, it's something, but I have to simply do. And the water exercise includes swimming. So being faithful, these physical activities, uh, in a way to really kind of, to take off of myself and my own pain. Uh, and it's incorporated into the community. So. Already, friends and family, they are with me in my worship. They are present in my prayers, in the Bibles, reading of the scriptures. Um, 
Not only that, of course, the practical health meals, shopping groceries, rise, numerous rise uh, to my therapies, uh, to doctor's appointments, um, keeping me accountable, even typing for me. Um, so the community was very much part of this process of um, convalescence and healing. But I remember that I had to ask for help. That was on my court. Uh, asking for help is very, very difficult for me it, because it really goes against every fiber of my being that wants self-sufficiency, independence, and control. Uh, but I had to ask for help because I was utterly dependent. It was humbling, at times humiliating, I thought, but it was the most redemptive thing I've done and I continue to do. Uh, so overall, Experiencing God's grace through faith, health, and community practices that I can say, as Paul confessed in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God's grace is sufficient for me because through, it's through my weakness his power is made perfect. Um, so my physical brokenness has become the locus of bearing the mark of Christ, not just a way to escape. My own brokenness has become the locus of Christ's grace. Therefore, I can confess, as Paul confessed in 1 Corinthians 15.10, I am what I am by the grace of God, and his grace toward me it has not been without in fact, it has not been in vain. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, the Lord. Give you peace, today and forever. Amen.